Well, from the hillsides of Davos to New York City, for our viewers worldwide, a very good morning. I'm Manus Krenny, in for Jonathan Farrow. These equity markets are reviewing the narrative from central bankers, from uh, Waller, Lagarde, and not. It's all about a new rates dynamic. Back up the truck in rates and review your equity allocation. The countdown to the open, it starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up on the show today, we just had the retail sales coming in hot, 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 sending equity futures lower and treasury yields higher. The global central bankers of the world push back. We begin with a big issue, curbing your rate enthusiasm. The market's a little optimistic. A little too optimistic. Too optimistic, really. On the rate cutting cycle. And the start of the, 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 the timing of rate cuts. The majority of the G10 central banks in terms of interest rate cuts. There has been some repricing. The expectation is that the Fed will cut rates at some point. The question is when and by how much. For the six rate cuts, that's a pipe dream if we have a soft landing. You're seeing a mixed bag in, in the overall data. The economy is actually doing great. The economy has been strong enough so we can keep rates stable for a while. Central banks are going to remain vigilant for longer. They are still concerned about how sustainable the recent disinflationary trend that we've seen. So what we're going to see is more of an elongated pause. The Fed is good at waiting and watching and, and lagging. The Fed is not going to rush to start implementing those rate cuts. Wait, lag, roll. More data in this system today. Mike McKee joins me now with it. So we've had central bank narratives and a little bit more data. Mike, good morning. Good morning, Manus. And again, it's the same question we've been asking for days. Uh, what is it going to take to take the markets off of the idea of so many rate cuts? Chris Waller, the Fed governor, pushing back strongly yesterday. Here's what he had to say. Becoming more confident that we are within striking distance of achieving a sustainable level of 2% PCE inflation. When the time is right to begin lowering rates, I believe it can and should be lowered methodically and carefully. I see no reason to move as quickly or cut as rapidly as in the past. Well, the markets took that under advisement and did back off a little bit. Then we got the strong retail sales report today. And right now, when you look at what's being priced for December, they're no longer pricing in six to eight rate cuts. They're pricing in 5.7 rate cuts. So not a big change uh, out of the markets in terms of the futures pricing at this point. And again, we ask, what is it going to take to get them on the same page as the Fed? Certainly. Waller got a help from the retail sales numbers as they come in extraordinarily strong for the month of December, up six tenths of a percent, double the November number. And look at retail control. This is data that goes into basically uh, the GDP numbers for consumer spending, up eight tenths of a percent after five tenths in November. Import prices flat, import prices X oil flat. So no inflation aspect from, in, uh, from imports during the month. And it does suggest that we're still seeing a strong economy. Atlanta Fed GDP now will come out later today. We'll see what they have to say. But uh, the forecast consensus for next week, about 1.5% for fourth quarter GDP, Vanis, that's going to go up. Whether that brings down the idea of further Fed rate cuts remains to be seen. You know, for March, we're still pricing in about a 60% chance of a rate cut. Yep, uh, although that has dropped from, from over 80%. Mike, thank you very much for the update there on the retail sales and the Fed speak. Let's talk about the narrative from central bankers around the world with Invesco's Matt Brill, Ashok Bhatia, Alf Neuberger, and Berman. So I listened to Waller yesterday, and for once the bond market actually did react. You then add in these other voices, Lagarde, along with not from the ECB. So we've got a trifecta of voices of central bank about moving carefully, pull back your timing. Finally, do you think this is getting through to the short end of the rates market, and will it build on that narrative? Let's take it to you, first of all, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the narrative. Ashok, good morning. Morning. 
Um, we think it will back. It can back up a little bit from here, but but probably probably not a lot. And and there's really two two big things going on. I think the first is the the endpoint for where policy rates are priced is seems to us pretty fair and appropriate. And that's you know a three percent funds rate, a two percent ECB rate. You know. 20 to 18 to 24 months from now. And, and that seems like a reasonable endpoint. And that will anchor a lot of the, the front end. But the second element is, you know, the market is really debating um, whether an easing cycle is going to be due to inflation normalization. So as inflation comes down, central banks adjust policy rates to, to keep real rates mm -hmm. steady or whether we're going to get significant economic weakness. And, you know, so but easing is a part of either solution. It's really just the, the pacing of it. And as we get more economic data over the coming months, we think we will see some softer growth. So this back and forth in rates, it's not going to go away. But these levels to us seem seem relatively fair. I, I mean, you just look at the retail sales and we'll come back to those in a moment. Again, blistering hot retail sales with a SLU's report that's under pressure. So it's hard to to choose your poison that you're going to put down. Matt, let me bring it to you. Uh, do you think sort of job done for the Fed for now? Are we finally coming to heel? Six are off the table, slow dissipation. The Fed will get us back towards the mean where the options market is. The options market's coalescing around three cuts. It's only everybody else in the media, apparently, that's just rampant with six. Yeah, good morning. I, I think the, the Fed did what they had to do, which is, um, you know, just continue to talk this down. Uh, you know, we think March is off the table, but you know, the, what really matters is the direction. And, and I completely agree with what was just said is that, you know, we're on the right path to call it three, three and a half percent, I guess, by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe maybe a little higher than that, but we're, we're going to get there, you know, early 2025. And so whether they cut in March, April or March or May, it doesn't matter so much. But the, the path is coming. Um, and we think it's going to happen because the data is going to be there. It's not because the economy is going to fall apart, but because the inflationary deflation, the deflationary forces continue to, to be prevalent and that's going to continue to flow through. So the Fed's going to talk it down all they want. But month after month, you're going to continue to see that inflation get more to their normalized levels. OK, so then this takes us to how do you want to position? And if I take it back to you, uh, Ashok, you said a year ago, underweight duration. But here you are. Overweight bias is appropriate. But I get the sense that you want to be more tactically, uh, have the tactical ability to trade these markets. You say an overweight bias is appropriate, while tactically shorter when the market appears to get over-optimistic on cuts. And guess what? Debt sustainability. We haven't talked about that for a while. So is this about ultimately long duration, but with tactical layovers uh, of shorts? Yeah, I, I break it into a couple of key areas. I think for short-term interest rates, so five-year and in maturities, um, there'll be a lot of noise back and forth. But we're we're investing in these points, characterize us as overweight investments mm -hmm. in these areas because as cash rates come down, people should extend duration, lock in these high yields. I think on the longer rates, it's a little trickier. Um, this cycle is reintroducing term premium, curve premium, inflation mm -hmm. premiums, and the valuation there, you know, we think we're a little bit below fair value. Um, and then the third real quick point is there is, we think still, you know, this is a pretty strong week for issuance and financials. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the European credit markets. So, you know, fixed income is still offering, you know, investors, you know, five to, you know, mid single digit uh, or mid single digit, high single digit returns, depending on your risk profile. So it's a little more nuanced this year than last year. But I think there's still there's still a fair amount to do to lock in these yields effectively. OK, uh, hold those thoughts. Ashok, we'll come back to you, Matt, in just a moment. It's all about the yield. It's almost like a, a song for you at the end of last year's charts. Uh, joining me now to look under the hood at some of the stocks that are on the move, Katie Greifeld is with me. Katie, what have we got? Let's kick off with Tesla, just like we did yesterday. The headlines around Tesla this morning, Tesla slashing Model Y prices in the European markets. That's according to Investors Business Daily. And that's on top of what we talked about yesterday with CEO Elon Musk pressuring the board for a bigger stock award. You add it together. Tesla down uh, over 2% right now. I want to highlight AMD. It closed at its highest level since November 2021 yesterday. It's climbing a little bit pre-market right now. That's after a round of price target upgrades from the sell side, including Barclays, which sees AI as a primary driver of growth. Definitely heard that one before. And Apple, uh, the Supreme Court refused to hear Apple's appeal in an antitrust suit. As a result, the company is opening up its U.S. app store to outside payment options. Uh, that's dragging down the stock a little bit this morning, down about 1% before the bell. 
Okay, uh, some interesting movies. Deja Vu, Tesla on the move, and first off the block with Katie coming up on the show. Uh, fresh inside on the US consumer. Consumers throughout uh, the last year found a good balance to uh, satisfy their spending priorities at the same time dealing with elevated prices and inflation. Yes, retail sales providing just the latest read for the consumer. What it could all mean for markets as rates review the sales. This is Bloomberg. So consumers throughout uh, the last year found a good balance to uh, satisfy their spending priorities at the same time dealing with elevated prices and inflation. But when we just look at the United States, we expect a story of continued prioritization. Consumers just being mindful of their spending because borrowing costs are still high. But relief might be waiting in the wings with the Fed as if and when they cut rates, which there are a lot of people who expect that. The Mastercard CEO there weighing in on consumer spending and the trend is continuing. Look at the numbers this morning. Sales are beating the estimates, blowing the doors off. A resilient consumer, the data uh, spending on clothing, department store shopping and food services. And that strength is likely to mean a delay in the rate cuts and the timing endorsing Fed Governor Waller's take. That still robust economic activity doesn't present a reason to move quickly on the rate cuts. And that was the narrative just 24 hours ago, reinforced in the hills of Davos by Lagarde. Katie Greifield, uh, were you out there helping the retail sales? I was. I did my bit for America. <laughs> you and me both, Manis. And I don't know if Fed governors are allowed to take victory laps, but I would imagine that Chris Waller may be feeling vindicated this morning. To uh, get specific on the numbers here, retail sales unadjusted for inflation rose by 0.6% last month. That is the strongest pace in three months. And as you mentioned, it was a pretty broad based advance. Nine of 13 categories posted increases, and that was led by clothing, department stores, e-commerce, and motor vehicle sales. And good news, gas station sales fell for a third straight month as, of course, pump prices continue to fall. So that U.S. consumer remains strong, Manus. And you take a look at the market reaction right now. It's fairly consistent. You have equity futures down, and you have bond yields higher, especially at the front end of the curve. You take a look at the two-year Treasury yield right now. It's higher by about 11 to 12 basis points. That's in addition to yesterday's advance. And that gets back to what Mike McKee was telling us just a couple of minutes ago, that as the data continues to roll in hot, that case for earlier rate cuts, it just continues to weaken. We've heard as much from Fed officials in recent weeks, and that is absolutely the conversation that's happening across asset classes this morning. Victory tastes so sweet, doesn't it, Katie? Even though I'm sure <laughs> central bankers wouldn't possibly say that that's how they feel. Katie Greifield uh, on the retail sales. My guests this morning are Matt Brill and Ashok Bhatia. Gentlemen, let me bring you the latest hot off the press quote from Ellen Zentner over at Morgan Stanley. The beat on the control at uh, retail sales. Governor Waller's recent remarks, the economy is strong enough that the Fed can remain patient in determining the next move. We expect the Fed the first cut Fed in the Fed funds is in June, while noting the risk toward an earlier start in May versus market pricing of March. Look, we're going to spend the next three months yapping about this until we actually get 25 basis points of a cut. And we know whether it's inflation or a crumbling economy that provokes it. But to this narrative, this is not going to be a pandemic-style rate-cutting cycle. This is not going to be a GFC-style rate-cutting cycle. And maybe that's where the bond market has got ahead of itself. So to both of you, Matt, bring it to you first of all. Uh, you're all about the yield. A backup in the truck of yield. Is it an immediate buy for you? It's just an incremental layering of buying? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think last year, <laughs> if you had asked me if a backup of yields was a buying opportunity, I would have said yes, but we would have done it, you know, with alligator arms. It would have been very hard to do. Um, now we feel a lot more convicted on, on where I was saying earlier, where the, the eventual path is going for rates. So um, I think there's a bit of a ceiling out the curve, just given the inflows that are coming and that any time we see a backup at all, yes, it's an absolutely a buying opportunity. Now, Ashok, you're a man after my own heart. Tell me about the yield of maturity. Don't give me the coupon. I can clip coupons all my life, but I've got to get the yield of maturity and understand, understand what that is. As you look across the curve, where is, let's say, the best yield to maturity in your view right now if we do coalesce around three to four cuts as opposed to six? 
I think if you're looking, you know, a bit more of a conservative investor, it's agency mortgages and, you know, five year types of financial securities, you know, banks and uh, money center banks and that. And if you're willing, able, want to take a little bit more risk, um, it's things like U.S. and European high yield, a little bit up in quality there and uh, emerging markets. And those can hit a little bit of the higher single digit return uh, yield to maturities. Matt, for you, it, it, it is about the rally. We've had a magnificent rally in investment grade and in high yield this morning. You got a little bit of a shake on that. And I just wonder, is it the same narrative for you, which is within IG, when you get a shake in the tree and you get a back up in yield and you get the opportunity to step into IG in the first instance, which is what everybody's telling me that you've got to be long off. So you must welcome these mini shutters. Yeah, I think we do. I mean, I think you know, we call it get another bite at the apple, and you've gotten a few few additional bites here. And I think you know when we back up, we see more inflows versus last year. We backed up, we saw outflows. So the, the market has turned in that regard, um, and I think that that sets us up for a nice little rally here. Um, you know, we're hashtagging uh, coupon and more in 24. You know, we do think you're going to get a coupon plus year. Um, it's just going to be a you know not a straight line. The rally was so vicious to end last year. You know, we're up still to date about 10 percent from where we were mid-October in the corporate debt market. So overall, quite a bit of rally last year stole from this year. But going forward, you know, anytime you get a backup, it's a good opportunity. We're seeing in, in, institutional accounts buying um, more than they did last year. But the really the new guest to the party is retail. Retail did not buy much at all last year, and they are really stepping forward this year. OK, so they're, they're stepping into the breach. There's two other moments that happened in the past couple of hours. One was a jock shock for CPI in the United Kingdom. I think that's the tail that's wagging the global bond dog. But also Christine Lagarde. She was cautious. She's setting the summer table. Let's just listen in. I would say it's likely too, but I have to be reserved because we are also saying that we are data dependent and that there is still a level of uncertainty and some indicators that are not anchored at the level where we would like to see them. So a prudent Christine Lagarde, a shuddering uh, CPI from the UK. To both of you, this is the worst nightmare for every central banker, which is you get this inflation jolt in the CPI, Matt. Um, how much more at risk is the US of that kind of a shock that the UK had today? Well, I, I think the path won't be completely straightforward. So, you know, they're, they're likely to be a hiccup along the way. So. You know, in that regard, you know, I, I'm a little bit concerned that you could you could have a little bit uh, of a shock here in one of these inflationary reports. But but really, the trend, you know, the data is just keeps showing us in eight different places that that it's coming down. So, um, you know, we think the biggest area that to, to watch is is the the wage market, you know, the, the employment market, and, and it's much more imbalanced than it was in 2023. And in that regard, we feel pretty good. Asha. To you, obviously, every central bank is trying to hold on to the narrative. Where is the risk here uh, for the U.S. in that narrative? Yeah, I, I don't think the risk is really on the inflation, Prince. Um, I think one key thing about this year is inflation volatility, um, at least in the first half of this year, is going to go down. It's getting to be much more predictable. I think you're seeing that in the, the prints that we've been getting have been much, you know, they've been bunching up closer to consensus. Mm -hmm. So th there, is, there is not a lot of, I think, deviation from where inflation is okay. going to go the first half and it's falling. It's growth and how quickly the labor market weakens. OK, the jolt will be growth, not not in the inflation. I'd say Bailey uh, in Threadneedle Street is probably pondering uh, those various outcomes for himself. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. Matt Brill and Ashok Bhatia, uh, my guests this morning on The Rates Moves. Coming up, your morning calls. A little bit later, we've got John Hancock's Emily Rowland helping me to make sense of the case for large cap US equities. That conversation still ahead on the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Let's get your morning calls from the analyst recommendation. What impact are they having? Morgan Stanley downgrades uh, Mutel to equal weight, seeing limited growth drivers on the horizon. Next up, UBS downgrades Ford to neutral, expecting a challenging year due to industry-related headwinds. And finally, JP Morgan downgrades Morgan Stanley to neutral, slaying your own, saying the shares are fairly valued with few catalysts for this year. 
Coming up, John Hancock's Emily Rowland unveils her outlook for the markets for 2024. Does she agree with the uh, with the banking court? We'll put those questions to her in just a moment. This is Bloomberg. down to the equity market open as the short end of the yield curve in the United States of America re-rates on the number, the size and the trajectory of rate cuts. So the equity market has got to review the momentum that was imbued in the November, December rally. Equities are lower, they're clapping, we like that. There is the opening bell. It's going to be an initial drift for equities uh, on the downside. We're going to get some of the regional banks, we'll get into those numbers in just a moment. Spoos are lower, NASDAQ is lower as rates re-rate higher at the short end of the curve, brought by 11 basis points. That has an impact on the growth to value trajectory. Uh, the dollar put on a mighty show yesterday, the biggest rally since March. The euro is down. Christine Lagarde says, wait until the summer. We'll go to the Côte d'Azur and then you may have a rate cut. So euro dollar drifts by a tenth of one percent. Yields, uh, as you can see, selling around the four percent level. My last two guests said when it richens up, that's when we will step ladder in. And crude drops by 1.9 percent as again the narrative around the oil market is more about poorer than estimated Chinese growth data along with disinflation or deflation uh, coming out of China at the pace that we haven't seen since 1999. We're in a risk-off mood and it's taking everybody down with them. Okay, those are your markets. Two stocks to watch, JetBlue and Spirit Airlines. I've yet to tra travel with them and a federal judge is blocking the $3.8 billion merger to antitrust concerns. Katie Greifield is with me. This is a blow to this airline sector. It is a blow. Spirit and JetBlue forced apart, like you mentioned, that U.S. District Judge siding with the federal government, saying that the merger would harm cost-conscious travelers and violate antitrust laws. JetBlue and Spirit, of course, argue that consolidation is the only way for smaller airlines to really compete in this industry. They're evaluating next steps. But what we know for now is that Spirit shares are in an absolute tailspin. You can see them down 15 percent pre-market. That's in addition to yesterday. 47% plunge. That was a record loss there. JetBlue faring a little bit better. It is down this morning, but it actually rallied by almost 5% yesterday. And that probably comes back to this deal's price tag. $3.8 billion for JetBlue to take over spirits. Shareholders clearly thought that was a bit pricey, Manus. Now, it remains to be seen what happens next. These companies can either appeal the ruling or abandon the deal altogether. Uh, but consensus says that challenging the judge's decision here would be a long shot, especially when you consider that the merger agreement is set to expire in about six months' time. Okay. Well, certainly it's, it's a different landscape here to that in Europe when consolidation was allowed during uh, periods of deep distress. Katie, thank you very much. Let's turn our page to financials. We've got regional bank earnings hitting the wire. We're underway. Citizens Financial, U.S. Bank Corp uh, are both reporting notable declines in the fourth quarter profit. Shanali Basic broadens the reach beyond the top tier of Wall Street to go regional. Shanali. Man, as when you look at the regional banking system, the, a system, the likes of Citizens and U.S. Bank Corp are going to be hit by FDIC charges tied to those bank failures last year that will hurt a little more for a mid-sized bank than it would perhaps for some of the biggest. Now, you are seeing the stock movement. Interesting, the parting ways here, a U.S. Bank Corp and Citizens getting a little bit of a lift here. You have to remember that the KBW Bank Index has still sold off quite meaningfully into this year. You have Schwab hitting some pains down more than 6 percent just remarkable it had missed estimates on net new assets as well as retail brokerage accounts remember Schwab is also coming off a tough year though it is a behemoth in its own sector a lot of competition among brokerages and as we know it got into a lot of banking services that made this year difficult I would also say that while net interest income at these regional banks the year's expectations are kind of muted here particularly when you look at citizens and US Bancorp one bright note note here is that charge off rates are not rising also meaningfully. So kind of calm credit quality here is what investors have to look forward to after such steep sell offs really leaving the KBW bank index in between where it was at its 52 week low right after that banking crisis and the 52 week high yet to be seen that is well past $100 and you're looking at a bank index down by 92 at the moment.
Yeah, well, certainly they take a big chunk out of the net new assets, dropping 48% to $66.3 billion. Shanali, thank you very much for wrapping up uh, the regional bank's report cards this morning. Let's turn our attention to the telecom sector. Verizon, they're writing down the value of its business services division by nearly $6 billion, a sign of declining sales. Isabel Lee can give us the detail. That is a chunky write-down. Very chunky indeed, man. It's and it's 5.8 billion to be exact, and that's one of the largest write downs in the company's history. So that's as the unit continues to grapple with falling results. So the company attributed the non cash goodwill impairment charge to secular declines and macroeconomic pressures. And after this charge, the company will be ending 2023 with 1.7 billion. So why has it come to this? So Verizon, as many know, is really a legacy company that's best known for its wireline operations. But this segment has since declined ever since its mobile services boomed. And in fact, Bloomberg Intelligence said that. Verizon's wireline business is expecting a muted 2024. For now, the consumer unit is the biggest revenue driver for Verizon. And shares last year ended 2023 lower by 4%. And right now, it's a touch lower by six tenths of 1%. Manus. Isabel, thank you very much. Switch over to the automakers. Day two. Tesla extending its monthly decline to roughly $90 billion after announcing a second round of price cuts just in as many days, this time in Europe. Ed Ludlow is with me from San Francisco. Two days in a row you show up within 24 hours with bad news on Tesla. What are you doing? It's not bad news from me, Manus, but actually in the last 30 seconds, Tesla's declines have accelerated beyond 3%. The news or catalyst is price cuts in Europe specifically for the Model Y. Mid single digits across a number of markets as followed. Prices in Germany down on the Model Y between 4.2 and 9.1%. Uh, 5.7 to 6.7% in France, 4.3 to 77 in the Netherlands, and up to 7.1% in Norway. It's been an interesting 12 months because at times the market has viewed Tesla's ability to cut prices and open new pockets of demand, that lever, as a real positive because operationally and on the bottom line, they are streaks ahead of the legacy OEMs and other EV makers. They have some wiggle room on the bottom line to do that, though. The other side of the coin is that there is uh, you know, a, a debate about whether these price cuts as a need to open new pockets of demand are indicative that the demand has gone away. Remember as well that Tesla plans to pause production at its Berlin plant uh, in the final week of January, first couple of days of February because of the impact from the Red Sea. And a senior Tesla source told me over the weekend that just like everyone else, Tesla's action in the context of the Red Sea was to divert shipments of key components on new routes. It's not that they won't end up in Berlin, it's just going to take them longer. So that and also the debate around Elon Musk's new compensation deal, asking for greater voting rights, adding some downward pressure to this stock, down 3% manners. Ed, thank you very much. Ed Ludlow there with the very latest on Tesla. John Hancock's Emily Rowland weighs in on the earnings season so far. This is what she says. Not a great start to the earnings season this past week. We still have a long way to go. The bar for companies to beat is much lower uh, than where it was just several months ago. Joins me now. Emily, good to see you this morning. I mean, I, I look at the performance in the earnings season so far, and this is what we've got for you. Um, what we have is if you missed on your earnings, you really are taking a smack. Now, this is also the analysts have lowered their expectations in terms of earnings growth. From what you've seen so far in this earnings season, it's still early innings. What do you make of it? Yeah, so again, still early innings, but the bar was lowered significantly. Analysts had been penciling in positive 8% earnings growth for the S&P 500 at the start of last quarter, and now it's negative 1%. So that's good news, but as you mentioned, companies that are missing are, are definitely being punished. One of the key narratives that we're watching closely is the fact that top line growth or revenue growth for the S&P 500, again, it's early, coming in around 2.8%. So that's below the five and 10 year average. So what we have to remember here is that revenue growth was awesome during the height of inflation. Uh, because companies could pass those higher prices along to the end consumer. So we saw explosive sales growth for companies. That's now normalizing, but we're also seeing profit margins getting compressed. That's coming in below five and 10 year averages. So what companies are dealing with now, of course, is a much higher cost of capital as rates have gone up at the same time that revenue growth is shrinking. So those margins are really getting challenged here. And the key 
for companies from here is who can manage that best in an environment where it's going to become a lot more difficult. Well, which sectors can manage that back um, if, if things do get a little bit more diff difficult? Everybody's telling me it's, it's a disinflation <laughs> story, not the U.S. falling off a cliff. Um, well, China is exporting deflation or disinflation, but yep. you know who can handle it better? Because Tesla obviously uh, has got a whole other narrative going on, but talk me through your view. Yeah, sure. So we continue to emphasize the quality factor. So these are companies with great balance sheets. Think about ones that don't need to tap the capital markets in order to grow. So low interest burdens, lots of cash, great return on equity. Now the poster child for high quality is the U.S. tech sector. Uh, we still like tech. We're not downgrading it. But as, it, as we all know, it was up 57 percent last year on 5 percent earnings growth. 5 uh, percent earnings growth was of the best we've seen for any sector across the globe, but still so much multiple expansion now. In fact, the S&P 500 growth index is now trading at a 44% premium to its 20-year average. So we want to think about owning other sectors that also score high on quality. Healthcare is one of those for us, and it's now trading at a 10% discount to the broad market. We think we're going to see some big changes in consumer behavior as people stop maybe buying all the stuff they want to buy, but they're still going to do the things they need to do, like go to the doctor and seek medical care and engage in utilities. Another one of our favorite sectors is we may see this rotation play out into more defensive parts of the market that, again, score high on those quality metrics. Of course, the retail sales report this morning, not quite telling that story yet. No, it's not. You know, thank goodness we all still get sick. We'll still need the doctor. We might not need a new <laughs> iPhone, but we're still going to need the doctor. That is resoundingly reassuring. Um, on the retail <laughs> sales, I mean, it really was a strong, strong report. How exposed to retail do you want to be? Because delinquencies are rising. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a while. But what exposure do you want to have to the consumer? I mean, it's my favorite phrase of 2023, the hedonism of the U.S. consumer. Don't ever bet against it. That's right. And here's what I wouldn't bet against. As long as people have a job, they're going to continue to spend. Some of the data we've seen suggests there's some weakening in the labor market. You know, things like the quit rate are back down to pre-pandemic levels. Job openings continue to normalize. You look at some of the survey data, um, like ISM services last week, and the em employment components plunging. But that's not really matching up to the hard data we're looking at. Initial jobless claims coming in near the lowest levels of 2023. Um, we, you know, with the non-farm payrolls report, I, I'm running out of ways to describe how it's so much stronger than expectation. So as the labor market continues to show this resilience, it's hard to see consumers pulling back from spending. But again, we would um, not be emphasizing the consumer discretionary sector. We are going to be contending with the higher cost of capital, not just businesses, but consumers with 25 percent credit card interest rates, elevated auto loans, of course, mortgage rates still very, very elevated relative to history. So I do think consumers will start to see those headwinds. Things like loan forbearance are no longer a tailwind. Excess savings have been spent down. Would it bet against the consumer in a period of a strong labor market? But it's hard to see what that catalyst is for a meaningful acceleration from here. Emily, hold those thoughts. Uh, we're going to return okay. to some of them in just a moment, sticking with us uh, for this morning. Coming up, JP Morgan unveiling plans to add to its headcount. The company has the returns and has the firepower to continue investing through the cycles. And that is what it really allows us to continue, regardless of the economic environment, to continue growing. Plus, the regional bank earnings get underway after a mixed quarter of America's biggest lenders. That conversation on Bloomberg. continue investing through the cycles, and that is what it, what it really allows us to continue, regardless yeah. of the economic environment, to continue growing. We have, at the moment, we are employing, at the end of this year, around 320,000 people, so the number of people that we employ has been growing and not shrinking, so uh, I think that where we see opportunities and we can help our clients, for sure, we will focus on that. When I look at our plans, we didn't increase we will increase our uh, staff this year, for oh. sure. 
JP Morgan President Daniel Pinto there planning to add to their overall headcount. Seeing numerous opportunities and projecting plenty of growth for 2024 after their record earnings. Meanwhile, you've got the regional banks. Uh, they're rolling in across the tape. U.S. Bank Corp and Citizens top out the estimates. Uh, but it's taking a hit to the net interest income. Shanali Basik is back with us again. Shanali, uh, the differential here, how do I draw the line between the two? Uh, between citizens and region, uh, the regional banks. Okay, yes. so we, it, it is an interesting moment here. You're not seeing the stock react significantly, Manas, here. You are seeing just a little bit of a pop, and you have to remember that these banks have sold off meaningfully, and we're looking at two of the larger super regional banks. And when we go through this earnings season, remember, we have many more banks to go. It's going to give you a bigger picture of what the landscape looks like. Remember, these two banks, because they're the larger of the super regionals, also took FDIC charges charges that investors are happy to get out of the way because it did weigh on the ability to return capital to shareholders, let alone put new money to work. And so even though for these two banks, uh, U.S. Bank Corp and Citizens in particular, you did have both average loans and leases and deposits fell, falling a little bit below estimates, you do have the worst of the banking crisis behind you, particularly for banks like those that are less exposed to more battered parts of the economy, let's say. We are still watching credit quality. We are still watching things like consumer loans and auto loans. Schwab, as you saw, is a largely different story because if you are among the biggest of big banks and or biggest of big brokerages here and you are not meeting the mark, you are seeing a nearly 6% sell-off here. And, you know, you're coming into this conversation talking about J.P. Morgan all of these firms are a long way away of the 21% returns that J.P. Morgan is inking today. So investors need a story uh, to help these banks get back to par when you think about what their pre-banking uh, tumult highs would be. You can call it a crisis or not, but many of these firms have never recovered. Yeah, and in many ways, uh, we're waiting to hear what Sergio Motti at UBS will deliver in terms of new financial targets. He's coming to eat their lunch in terms of allocation to banks. Shanali, thank you very much. Shanali Basik there uh, with the Super Regionals. Emily Rowland is with us to talk equities. Emily, you say the financial sector is an extreme example of taking down the earnings growth in the back quarter of 2024. A lot of it was to do with FDIC. We're seeing, yeah. we're seeing the, we're actually seeing the, the lines printed on FDIC now. Are we past the worst? Do you think it's still going to be an issue with us for 2024? Or how do you look at financials? Have we passed the worst in that respect? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at it via the lens of the comps from here. So whereas Q3 of 2020, sorry, Q4 of 2023, um, we're seeing about negative 40% reported earnings growth. Again, a lot of that due to the charges uh, to the FDIC around the regional bank issues. Now analysts are significantly upgrading their expectations for Q4 of 2024, penciling in over 20% earnings growth. And that's a trend that we're seeing across the S&P 500. So right now, we're, while the bar is low, negative for this quarter, we're looking at analyst community penciling in 20% earnings growth for the S&P 500 in Q4 of 2024. Now, let's not forget that that's on top of almost 20 times forward earnings being priced into the market. So not only have you seen this incredible amount of multiple expansion, but you're also seeing really optimistic earnings growth baked into the denominator. So, you know, for us, it's really hard to see where that significant kind of breakout in stock prices can come without a significant acceleration in earnings growth from here, not only for financials, but for the broad market. If we just step back for a moment, you know, with such a momentum in November and December, a recalibration in January. I'd imagine if I was sitting in your seat at the moment, you'd say, look, I'm quite happy with a little bit of truck backing here in the yields and in equity markets. It lets me reflect on where I do want to pick up dips. Mm -hmm. is, is that how you're thinking at the moment? I mean, rather than being asphyxiated and fearful, you try and look for the opportunities of where did I miss the bus last year that I can maybe jump on board? Yeah, that's exactly what it is right now. We do think that there are some opportunities in the market, again, to find things that are already trading at a discount. Uh, we're looking at areas like U.S. mid-cap equities, which are trading at the biggest discount to their large-cap counterparts since the late 1990s. We talked earlier about healthcare and utilities also offering some value, but it's not a surprise to see the markets taking a little bit of a breather here. You know, in November, we first started to see that big Fed pivot, inflation coming down, the Fed suggesting cuts. That was reiterated in December, and we've been calling that the great 
pivot party and everybody was invited to it. Uh, no matter how much risk that you wanted to take in portfolios, you were rewarded. And now we're kind of feeling a bit of the hangover from that. Or maybe it's the dry January that <laughs> investors are trying out right now. I, some of us have failed or some have succeeded at that. Um, but really what we're seeing today is just a little bit of a pause and we're back into this kind of good news for the economy is bad news for the markets. I mean, you see the retail sales numbers this morning, industrial production coming in better, the labor market still holding in with strong data that's causing this backup in rates that's been exacerbated by investors kind of recalibrating their expectations for how much we can see in cuts next year. So I think pretty normal here for markets to be taking a little bit of a breather. I think if the lagged impact of Fed tightening does not cause something to break, which is usually what happens uh, in these late cycle environments, and markets can continue to chug along here. I just think it's optimistic to think we can get another year of 25 plus percent returns. Okay, well, they're certainly taking a hack to, the, to this NASDAQ this, mor this morning. The NASDAQ 100, yeah. min NASDAQ 100 mini down 1.4%. Spoos are off by 7 tenths of 1%. That's what you call an attack on tech. Uh, Katie, thank you very much uh, with the very latest there. Coming up on the show, uh, the market moving events you'll need to watch out for. That is your Trader's Diary up next. Let's get you up to speed with your trading diary. This is what you need to watch for the rest of the week. Secretary Yellen discussing Bidenomics at the top of the hour. Then the Fed's beige book hits the tape at 2 p.m. Eastern. And on Thursday, there's another round of jobless claims and housing starts. Friday, it's the deadline for the U.S. government shutdown and a look ahead to existing home sales. And the UMICH sentiment survey will also keep an eye on the inflation expectations in that survey. As you can see, Jonathan's in Davos. I'm here. That was Countdown to the Open. Uh, and this is Bloomberg.